Hello and welcome. Uh, here we are uh, in lecture 19. And so as you see from today's title, taking a moment to kind of slow down for a second uh, to kind of uh, cover some loose ends about Chisel. In particular, this is something where there's a number of things we kind of meant to cover along the way or things we as the staff have observed uh, in submissions. And we thought it might be kind of a good way to kind of clarify some concepts. And so uh, there's kind of a nice variety of things here. I'm sure uh, everyone is guilty of at least one of these. <laughs> and so it'll be OK. So if, it's, if something seemed clear, don't worry. That's great. And we'll move on to the next one. Perhaps that might be something more uh, interesting. Um, so as I said, we're going to kind of recap both how Chisel works and kind of give some uh, tips, right? And these tips both fall under the category of this is something you should avoid because this is going to produce incorrect behavior or is going to be dangerous to more just stylistically kind of making a argument about kind of aesthetics. Um, so let's kind of see how those play out. So we can go ahead and uh, load some Chisel libraries. So first off, I wanted to kind of recap what's going on for a Chisel uh, environment, Chisel program, right? I think we've been talking about this and using it, but it's worth really kind of teasing apart and appreciating all the little pieces, right? So as we said before, right, your Chisel design, uh, or if you think it's your Chisel, you know, your writing is, you know, a valid Scala program, right? You name the files .scala and um, don't worry, if it wasn't a valid Scala program, you've already experienced that. That's a compile time error you're getting from a Scala compiler, right? So um, assuming you've uh, gotten past that point, you have a valid Scala program, right? And, you know, what's, what is Chisel? Chisel's kind of almost like an illusion, right? It's, it's an embedded domain-specific language we've kind of constructed, you know, if we're kind of, you know, being a little bit imaginative. And, but at the end of the day, it's just a Scala library. So you're, you're writing Scala code. There's certain, you know semantic intent or design intent we're kind of conveying it the way we're using these library components but at the end of the day you are Scala programmers writing Scala code using a Scala library right so okay so that's the starting point and let's say you know you get your thing to compile right so it's now a valid Scala program so what's going to happen well it's going to execute uh, and you know the, over the course of execution it's going to create your design and then when the design is fully created uh, so we kind of refer to that process the construction phase then there's the elaboration phase where your design uh, is perhaps either turned into Verilog if you want to, you know, give it another tool for Verilog processing, or um, if you want to hand it off to, uh, you know, a simulator like Treadle to simulate it. And so Treadle can simulate directly on something called Virtle, which is the thing that comes right out of Chisel. Uh, other tools may prefer you to turn in a Verilog first, but either way, that's kind of that's after elaboration, right? So kind of remember the steps are compiling your Scala program, running your Scala program, which constructs your hardware design, and then elaborating it down to something you're going to use for either simulation or for, you know, Verilog processing. So when you're in that construction process, anytime you reference what we call, you know, a chisel object or chisel thing, it gets constructed, right? So if I say, you know, 4.u, or even if I take one of the inputs that already exists, so io.in already exists by virtue of us, you know, declaring our module, let's say I negate it. So now I put a negation operator, which is going to point to io.in as its input. Those those are you know now chisel objects that exist, right? So you kind of think of you know your execution is you know these things kind of floating around in memory. So these, these are objects you've created, right? And so each one of these objects has a number of you know fields and parts to it, uh, including the output or outputs it produces, right? Because some have multiple, uh, as well as the input fields, right? And so you may have, you know, experienced this, especially when playing around in notebooks, you know, if you try to uh, just write some chisel snippets on its own outside of a module, you're going to get some sort of, you know, compile or sorry, execution error, right? So say, oh, it's an exception. You can't, you can't do this. And the reason why is you're outside of, uh, you know, what we call a builder context, right? But essentially when you say things like extends module, not only is that adding in your know, expectation, you're going to give an IO field and going to automatically add in clock and reset for you. Um, there's a lot of other things, right? So that way, when you, uh, you know, now can appreciate since we covered inheritance, you know, now we know under the hood that, hey, when I make this chisel object, it's able to kind of crawl the Scala hierarchy, little bit of reflection is kind of neat, able to figure out, oh, wait, in what, you know, class I instantiate in and recognize, oh, wait, this is like, you know, this chisel thing and I can register myself with this module. Hey, I'm, you know, been constructed, I am blank, right? So. Okay, so at this point, you know, you've written a Scala program, you've kind of created a sea of chisel objects that are all tracked by this module. 
And then what do you do with them? You connect them, right? So use this connection operator, right? That colon equals, or even the bolt connection operator uh, with the, you know, the, the connect, uh, two double carrots. And what you've done is you've not changed anything in Scala land, but you have changed the internals of these chisel objects. In particular, what you're doing with those connection operators is you are uh, connecting the output of one thing to the input of another thing, right? So in particular, the right side of the connect statement, that's the output. So when you go grab that object, right, it knows how to, you know, find the right field in there. Um, so, okay, this is the output of that thing. And then uh, when you connect it to the input of the other thing and between the left side of that colon equals, then you are attaching input to it. So in terms of how the graph is actually modified, the input tracks who's producing its input. It's actually usually not any marking of the output knowing it's being consumed, but that's a small detail. Um, okay, so the input's connected, right? So uh, let's kind of remind ourselves what we've done here. Okay, so we've created a bunch of objects and we connected them together in the chisel world, right? Um, and so another way to kind of think of this whole process is what you're doing is you are making a Scala program that instantiates chisel things and connects them, right? So it's kind of two things you're doing. You're instantiating things and connecting things, right? Um, and so we talk so much about, you know, oh, let's build really sweet parameterized uh, flexible generators. That's all really from the Scala. That's kind of the Scala program that's running. But in terms of the core operations it's using in the chisel world, right? The chisel operations you're using really are, you know, instantiation of things and connections. There's also, you know, the combinational logic kind of stuff of, you know, I want to do an add or, a, you know, an AND gate or something. But fundamentally what you're doing is you're instantiating things and connecting them. That's what you're doing. Because uh, remember, it kind of, big picture, right? Your hardware design is just this big um, design, right? You know, there's, you know, wires, connecting things. And so for years and years, you've all taken many programming courses and you've been kind of trained how to think sequentially and how to think about things changing over time versus in hardware, right? You're just trying to build this big uh, design in the graph. The internal values in the graph are going to change. We're going to talk more about the next slide. But in terms of what you're doing in your program, you are, like I said, you're instantiating to chisel things and connecting them together, right? In particular, your goal is to connect the right combination of things to the inputs and outputs of your modules, right? Uh, why? Well, that's all that's visible, right? Um, if you instantiate some stuff inside your module that's not connected to an input or an output, it's going to get automatically pruned away by the tools. <laughs> and the reason why it's able to do that is because uh, it knows that nobody can tell you've done that. Um, and so, uh, that's all it is, right? So all the steps going on, all those crazy tricks with functional programming, inheritance, all that stuff, you know, that's just ways of us making our Scala program, you know, behave in ways we like and make our lives easier. But in terms of what core functionality we're using in Chisel, instantiating things, connecting things. Whew. Okay, maybe I'll pause if there's any questions on this portion before I go on to kind of clarify some more stuff. Okay, let's keep going then. Um, so as I kind of said a minute ago, right, you should really think of your hardware design as a static thing, right? So static structurally, right? See, connection of, you know, components with wires in between them. Um, that's what it is. Now, those wires can have different values on them at different times. But the hardware is fixed, it's static. Even though we think of things as, you know, like a MUX is, oh, a MUX lets me do conditional stuff. Remember, the MUX connectivity is exactly the same. It's not changing. It has the exact same input connections, the exact same output connection. What's changing are the values being passed in over those wires to the MUX. But the MUX, topologically, in terms of how it's connected to everything else, that is not changing, right? And so, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a single fixed thing. And what's really kind of changing is the values on these wires, right? So sometimes you get confused about designing a module, um, remind yourself, right? Think of the topology you want to have, right? If you were to draw on paper the schematic for what you're trying to make, imagine what's going to be. I want to have, you know, a register here, connected to this MUX. I want to have this. If you find yourself really kind of stumped on a problem, fall back to that, right? If you, if you can't um, draw what you want on paper as a schematic, that means uh, you need to think more about your problems. I think you're a little bit still confused about what's going on. When you're really able to kind of visualize it as a design, as a schematic, 
then turning down the chisel is not so bad, right? Um, you know, for everything you want to instantiate, you instantiate. For things you want to connect, all those wires, you connect them, right? Um, so that getting that module the first time usually isn't so bad. This is part of why my advice for development processes is to kind of, you know, focus on getting a single instance right and then starting to kind of incrementally add more and more flexibility and parameterization to make a generator. Um, and that's the kind of reason why I recommend that, right? And so, but like I said, at the core level, kind of appreciating what's going on, right? You're just creating this topology of, you know, gates and registers and wires connecting them, um, et cetera, right? And so then, remember internally those wires, of course, uh, with the abstractions we have in this class, right? A wire can only have one value at a time, right? Uh, it really just is taking its input and immediately propagating that to its output, right? Uh, so if I see different values on a wire, especially if, you know, if I'm looking at something like, you know, like a waveform viewer, that's not because anything the wire did. That's because the input to the wire changed, right? Uh, unlike, you know, a register or memory, which has, you know, internal state. However, those things only change uh, at a uh, clock edge, right? So particularly at a rising edge, we make the input become the output. And sometimes it's easy to get this kind of lost in the shuffle because remember the clock's implicit on the register elements. And so sometimes you lose track of, you know, uh, where things are. Some people even have conventions and they write their hardware designs of, you know, putting a prefix or suffix on the names of registers or wires make it clear themselves, you know, oh, hey, you know, this is, you know, underscore R, make them really know it's a register. Some designs even actually, um, if it's a multi-cycle uh, component, they even actually have a suffix for which stage it's in. So it'll say underscore S0 or underscore S1 or underscore S2. They kind of remind themselves temporally where this is, right? But understand that you know, even if you're naming the register S2, it's always one register, right? It's always going to be there. It's always going to have the same input wire, same output wire. It's just a matter of you know how um, you think about the time propagating through the signals, right? And so, like I said, hopefully this is you know by now after doing this for six weeks, this is familiar. But I just kind of want to really make sure to kind of hammer this home about um, what's going on with all these kind of concepts and things. So maybe I'll pause here for any questions about you know big picture about chisel and that's and Scala and that sort of stuff. Okay. Well then, uh, I'll keep going if there's no questions so far, but please do stop me. And especially if you also just want to... Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, can you clarify what you mean by connecting them? Like just... Uh, it's actually gonna have two wires. Okay, so I, maybe I'll go ahead and repeat this question so for the recording. So the question is, if I have a, a module, and inside that module I have a sub-module, like another module instantiated inside of it, and I connect uh, the outer I.O to the inner I.O. For example, maybe, you know, I.O. dot out, you know, colon equals, you know, inner module dot I.O. dot out. Um, if you look at what comes out the other end, uh, it's going to uh, produce, uh, you know, each of those interfaces on those modules corresponds to, you know, uh, you know, wires in those interfaces, right? And it's gonna connect those. So you're actually gonna see the I.O. dot out connected to the, you know, uh, some modules I.O. dot out, right? So you actually see multiple connections in there. Now, uh, there may be times in your design process where you kind of feel like those module boundaries are a distraction. So if you look into documentation, you can read about how to request the tools inline a module and essentially, you know, evaporate that boundary and flatten in that instance. Um, Correct. Something to be a little verbose for recording. So, uh, yes. So the question was, the comment was, oh, wait, that seems helpful. But, you know, sometimes maybe you kind of want encapsulation for making your code manageable versus encapsulation you want to, you know, reuse things externally and, you know, be tracked. And so exactly right. Um, we've been really encouraging you to use modules. Uh, but as we kind of shown at some point, sometimes you actually can get away with 
either a Scala function or a Scala class that's not technically a module. So in order to be used, it needs to be instantiated inside of a module, uh, but it still kind of encapsulates helpful circuitry, right? So uh, like the counter from chisel.util is a really good example of that. That's actually not a module, right? That's a Scala class that, you know, it contains the logic to have the register for the counter as well as the incrementing and that kind of stuff. Um, but it's, it's not actually a module. Okay, hopefully that answered the question. Um, yeah, great. And then, um, yeah, so please continue to stop me. So I have a bunch of, you know, slides of random scenarios with tips. So feel free to ask questions or even just uh, pontificate about what you might think is more clear stylistically. Um, oops, sorry. Go. There we go. Um, okay, so uh, you've probably heard uh, myself and the TA frequently discouraged use of uh, mutability or, you know, things like bar. Um, and so there's kind of multiple levels to this thing. <laughs> Uh, sometimes we just say that because it's concise for some kind of capture and we believe that by avoiding things like var you can avoid a lot of bugs, which is true. But uh, I kind of want to approach this thing in three different phases, right? So phase one, in this first slide, I want to bring up the issue of just conceptually appreciating what var means for your chisel design. Uh, and then we'll talk more about why it's dangerous in chisel in the coming slides. So uh, remember, var, that's something in Scala, right? So we, we said, remember, that our... Our chisel design is really a Scala program that's instantiating chisel components and connecting them together. That's all it is, right? And so the var is kind of um, like a different level, right, uh, in terms of what it is. So it's something we're using to write our, our Scala, but the, the chisel tools actually, for the most part, really can't tell if you're using a var or a val, right? Because that's something that happens in the Scala execution, and that's something that's um, not really apparent to chisel, right? And so... For example, on some of the earlier assignments, I think, you know, uh, students have uh, moved past this. Uh, we saw things like this. We've seen the incorrect example down below where someone wants to, um, uh, you know, for example, change a value, right? So uh, there's a few things going on with this assignment below, right? Um, number one, you're using a var and assigning it multiple times, which, you know, we'll cover that why it's not great on the next slide. Um, but additionally more conceptually, right, this person has identified that they want this value to change. But I said, don't confuse the changing of a fixed static wire in Chisel over time with it changing in the program in Scala, right? These are kind of two different type places where things are changing. In terms of what you want in the hardware, yes, the wire can hold different values, but you want the wire to have the same inputs and outputs, right? You don't want that to change. Um, However, it's going to have different values carrying over it, right? And so, yeah, so the notion that, oh, yes, I want this to be mutable. Yes, the wires are mutable, right? It's actually, um, there's not really too many constructs we have in Chisel if you want to specify, like, this wire uh, can't change value. You can attach a literal to it, and thus, you know, it's connected to a constant. And since it's connected to a constant, it's not going to change. But there's not really an easy way for you to, like, enforce the fact this wire never changes or something. Um, but however, in the course of Scala, you have var and val to play with, right? So with that in mind, right, we don't really need to mark a wire as mutable in Chilla because it, it is mutable as a, because it's going to have different values coming over it. And remember, when you have these constructs you're playing around with in Chisel, what you're pointing to are uh, Chisel objects, right? Um, so the mutability of data over time, that's internal, right? It's inside these Chisel objects. But in terms of what you're playing with in your Scala program, you're just playing with the topology. You're just playing with which Chisel objects exist and what they're connected to. Um, so, uh, too bad my cursor seems to have vanished. Um, oops, I can maybe just kind of implicitly highlight things. Uh, can I get there? Okay, well, 0.u is going to be a chisel literal of 0, right? Um, meanwhile, a counter 1 plus u, what's it going to do when it creates that statement? It's going to look at the prior assignment to counter, because this is a var, so the order really matters. The prior assignment to counter was 0.u. So it's going to uh, find that zero dot u, perform the plus operation on it, and uh, create a one literal and add that to it, right? And then create this new thing. So now you're going to get back this, you know, 
thing which represents the addition of zero and one. And technically, actually, both inputs are literals, right? They aren't changing. Um, but so now counter is just that, right? So it's not going to change value over time. You've just created a reference to zero one, right? So now, of course, below is what you know we should be doing. And there's a few things to note. It's not just a var versus val. It's also the fact that you know what you want for a counter is something that's going to hold a value and change, right? So you need to make sure you have a state element like register to hold that. Um, and notice how uh, here we're able to use all immutable things because we aren't changing the topology. We're just and so topology is simply that we want a register and we want to connect it, its output to an adder to add one to it and plug it into its input. That's all we're doing, right? So that's the topology. Over time, naturally, it's going to change values, right? Because you know if you have the clock stable signal enabled to that register, uh, it's going to do the right thing. So, like I said, really keep straight the difference between uh, the values changing in the wires, which is totally normal, uh, versus you know your topology. As like I said, your topology for your design is fixed, right? You know, once you finish that construction phase and move on to elaboration, you can't change your topology, right? So your hardware design is fixed. And so in your mind, like I said, you should be able to kind of draw a schematic for your hardware. And um, that's it. That's your design. And so it's kind of a question of just how do you write the Scala program to produce that uh, topology? So as I said, I'm going to keep uh, bashing on VAR today. I'm sorry, but uh, it really should be used pretty rarely. Um, and uh, so let's talk about that, right? So. Uh, another reason to avoid var is that you can sometimes introduce bugs into your code, right? So val, although it's more restricted, is actually a way to kind of give yourself a little bit of a, a safety blanket, right? Um, and so, uh, like I said, the chisel really can't tell when you're using var. Uh, however, uh, some, earlier in the quarter, some students reported an error message which I was unfamiliar with and I wasn't able to recreate on my own until some dots are connected and I realized, oh wait, there actually was some new functionality as a chisel to kind of try to catch some of these mistakes, right? Which is nice. Uh, I can't catch all of them, but I can catch some of them. So this, this error message here, right? Source of the escape scope in which it was destructed. That's a little bit of their ability to check for this, but they can't always check for this, right? Um, and especially now we've covered functional programming and other stuff, you can get away with doing functional programming stuff, which is all immutable rather, rather than worrying about um, having to use var and for loops and stuff. So. Uh, let's see how well this is going to work without uh, my mouse cursor. Uh, oops, can I get down into that box? Yes, I can. Uh, okay, fantastic. Okay, so here we have uh, you know an example of using var. So here, you know, maybe I'll start off with val, right? So this works just fine as a val, right? I want to create a wire, uh, and basically I'm just going to uh, kind of implement a ReLU here, right? You know, uh, if it's less than zero, make it zero. Uh, it's on assigned input, otherwise the same thing. And, you know, you might be able, of course, use about the wire, but the wire allows to kind of show the tricks with the var. So if I just run this, oops, let's see if I can scroll. Okay, I'm going to zoom out. Okay, that worked. All right, so uh, it did the right thing, right? You see we have, um, oops, you can see we have uh, a mux. It's choosing between um, uh, the, the alternatives, right? Um, it's either going to be uh, you know a zero or the thing coming in. Okay, so if we change this to a var, but we happen to you know fortuitously use the var in the right way, totally fine. Uh, you know, it's fine since it gets the right, right answer. Recommend against the var. Um, okay, now what happens if I make this? Slight, slight, oops. Let's see if I can get back into the right box. Make this slight, 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 slight typo and do this. Uh, which, you know, at a quick glance, especially late at night, would not seem unreasonable. Can the compiler help me? Uh, no, but we're going to get the wrong result, right? <laughs> so um, here we now have hard coded our output to zero. So that conditionality about the when. That's that that's gone, right? Uh, so what happens? Well, because W was assigned as a created as a var, uh, when we did the uh, you know equals zero dot s, we reassigned that W. So the original association with W being a wire initialized to io dot in, 
That's gone. Poof. Evaporated. Uh, now W uh, points to zero. And so that's when we look at it later on. Uh, it's going to uh, be just zero. That's what we that's what we get. Now, of course, uh, you can imagine why I was so keen to... Oops, let's get the right mouse cursor. Where am I? Am I on the wrong screen? I'm on the right screen now. Okay. Um, now, uh, if I did this as a val, of course, it wouldn't let me do it, right? So that's one way to kind of save us. So then, then maybe perhaps the better question is, why does this even work in the first place uh, like this, right? So remember what we're doing here, right? So what we're saying is... Um, uh, we're not changing W, right? Uh, w is still a pointer, or no reference, we're going to think of it, to this wire object. Now, wire init says, you know, initially assigned this wire of a certain value. And wires in Chisel are a little bit interesting, right? Because even though the objects themselves, we have the single object, because of this, you know, last connect semantics, we're able to... Um, change your input. In particular, in the when statement, we conditionally change its input. So the, so the wire still exists. Uh, it's just we can create this condition about when it's connected to a certain thing or not. Um, and that, of course, is handled by tools and turned into a mux. And so at the end of the day, of course, we get hardware, which, as you see below, uses a mux to kind of handle that conditionally. But stylistically, you can see that, you know, the val helped us save a certain class of error, right? Which is great, right? The more we can push errors into compile time and less into when we're executing, to make our life a lot better. Um, so yeah, here's another example of where uh, var can come back and bite you, and hopefully we can kind of avoid that. Questions on this example? Okay, well, let's move on. I think I can actually increase the font size again. Actually, maybe I shouldn't. Um, so uh, on that same vein, uh, you know, so var handles uh, a single um, uh, mutable thing, right? Alternatively, uh, we've also come across these mutable collections, which, uh, you know, we use them for homework three because we haven't really covered functional programming yet. But in general, you should use them pretty sparingly. Um, and uh, especially with functional programming, we can really kind of avoid the need for it. In particular, you know, if things are independent, we can often get away with map or for each. Now, um, or, you know, for, for collections that exist, you know, things like dot tablet or dot bill, for example. And so, okay, let's kind of talk about this, right? So, let's say, and this is pure scholar, we're not even doing chisel at this point. You know, let's say you want to have some, you know, array, and you want to just add one to every one array. Um, you can see below that's, you know, we're not using a var, you know, but we are using a mutable collection. Array buffers are mutable, and we are changing their values, right? Uh, and so we're doing two things, right? We're mutating the values, which has certain, you know, things that make it hard to reason about or debug. And uh, we also are iterating, right? Where the iteration here isn't super critical, right? These are actually all completely independent operations, right? It's not like, you know, we're looking at A by minus one or anything. No, we're just adding one of those elements, so this iteration, the fact that it's a for loop, that's kind of almost like adding in unnecessary conceptual details, right? So of course with functional programming, we know how to slam dunk this by just, you know, like down below, you can see with incremented, we just do a map, we want all the elements, we just want to add one to them, let's do that. Also notice how the way down below, when every time we do an operation with these immutable things, we are creating a new name, right? That's fine, that's, that's, oh, that's good, right? That's the kind of way you can't keep track of things. Now let's see if I can get Edit mode, yes. Okay, so, oops. Edit mode with the arrow keys is dangerous. Okay, let's see if I can't. It's really hard when you can't see your mouse. Um, whew, okay, so hypothetically, you might imagine somebody might say, you know what? Uh, Instead of doing this, we've seen this a few times in people's code, uh, they do this, right? They're like, oh, well, I want to increment it, but I don't want to rename it. And they do that. Um, so that's also not great, right? Because uh, here we have a mutable reference or a mutable variable, right, pointing to a uh, 
immutable collection, right? So if I had to choose between two of these, I'd rather you do this than the one above. <laughs> However, you know, arguably you don't even need to do that, right? You can just make a new variable name, right? <laughs> so I would do that. Um, yeah, so when possible, and not just when possible, nearly always, uh, really be careful to use these mutable things, whether it be var or these collections. Now, there's a handful of cases where if you really know what you're doing, you can get it right, but um, it's actually pretty rare. So I'm not going to bother risking uh, upsetting all these crazy desktops I have here, but in another terminal window, I had pre-run on the rocket ship repo, you know, a very large scale repo, and grepped for val space versus var space. And if I remember right, it was on the order of like 6,000 val space occurrences in those files, uh, as opposed to about 50 vars, right? So in other words, uh, you know, more, far, 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 far fewer instances, right? And that's kind of the point. So like var, there might be a handful of cases you really, 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 really need to use it, but you can mostly get away with it without it. And you should. When it comes to collections, uh, for this course, you should always use the immutable ones. Maybe for your Scala behavioral model, there's like one case where you need to kind of use a immutable one, but like, especially within your chisel designs, you should probably almost always use the immutable ones. Uh, and some of the other Scala products I've written, uh, you can do almost everything just fine with the uh, immutable collections. Uh, you get pulled in immutable collections, not because of convenience, but sometimes for performance reasons, where if you have a giant collection, you want to change only one element, to you know, recreate that collection and change when almost kind of wasteful. That's a you know weird artifact of functional programming. But in our case, where these functional chisel designs, we have you know pretty modest sized collections. It's all about getting it right. Get it right. Keep things immutable. Cool. Uh, questions on this? Uh, okay. So these next few slides are kind of a little bit more abstract, but uh, kind of commenting some general trends we saw. Right. So. Um, one of them is, you know, try to reduce the amount of special cases, right? So, uh, you know, if you find yourself copying and pasting code and modifying it slightly, it's always kind of a little bit of a warning to go off in the back of your head about, can I make this cleaner? Now, sometimes maybe for a deadline, you kind of think I'm just going to sprint to get this done. I know it's not great, but you just want to get it done. Even then it's worth thinking about ways to kind of be more flexible, right? Um, number one, of course, if you kind of have this hard coder, you know, if parameter equals one, if parameter equals two, if parameter equals three kind of things in your code, if number of parameters, number of values that parameter gets pretty big, it's going to be hard to deal with, right? Um, it's not going to scale. What if someone gives you parameter four and you only go up to one, two, three, right? It's going to be broken. Um, so you want to be more general, right? Uh, and uh, it turns out if you think about what you're doing and you think about what the conditions are in the base cases, often you actually need zero corner cases. You actually can get away with just one general thing which handles all the parameters you want to support. Things like fold left, where you kind of give that initial thing to feed in there, right? Uh, fold left with zero elements, you know, returns that first thing you're passing in. So that can be a very graceful way to handle things. Um, if you need to handle a special case, maybe try to limit yourself to just one special case. If you think you have more than one special case, perhaps maybe you should rethink what your general thing does and perhaps you can kind of handle that. So this is kind of, like kind of a general tip. You know, I'm sure people are kind of familiar with this, but maybe it's kind of worth me kind of giving an additional nudge about thinking about how general your code and how flexible your code is and um, avoiding kind of too much special casing. Okay, yeah, stop me on any one of these if there's any questions or style comments or pontifications. Um, kind of in a similar vein, uh, you know, I just spoke quite a bit about uh, thinking about how mutability works through your design and, uh, you know, in our examples, we saw us use kind of, you know, for and for each quite a bit, right? So it's kind of a remind ourselves uh, how does it kind of fit into the big picture, right? So um, for and for each are both Scala constructs that you know, affect the Scala execution, that construction phase. And um, how we kind of choose to use those kind of depends, right? Uh, and so, um, you know, as you said, our chisel design is really just instantiating things and connecting things. So thus, uh, when it comes to how to use for and for each, um, usually we're kind of instantiating and or connecting things, right? And you know, sometimes for instantiating things, you can use things like uh, seek.fill or seek.tabulate, and you don't even necessarily need to have a loop at all, right? Um, and so uh, there's a few different ways of thinking about it, right? Um, so if we're having this iteration, you know, of either for or for each, 
Um, usually the goal is kind of some sort of side effect. That's why we're using four for each router and map. If there's some sort of output we want from each little execution on each element, then we're going to use map, obviously, right? But if we're using four for each, that's because we know we usually want some sort of side effect, and that's almost always, you know, a connection or something, right? Maybe we're going to instantiate something and then connect it, right? You saw plenty of examples in prior lectures, like, you know, like a network, you're kind of connecting all the ports or something, et cetera. In terms of whether to use four or for each, you know, you can often use either one. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, that's not always the case. But for us, where we often have indexable collections where you can kind of, you know, give an index and get the value back out, yes, you can kind of use either one. So style-wise, I kind of see two different ways to kind of use these. Um, if the collection you're working with already exists and uh, the range you're using to access it already exists, um, sometimes for each is really elegant. You say for each and just do it, right? However, maybe there's a time when you actually need to, you know, index into things or you need to create that range. I personally find it more clear to use a for loop when I want to create the range, you know, for i and zero to, you know, num something. Because uh, alternatively, of course, I could have just as well have said, you know, in parentheses, zero to num something and then dot for each, right? But um, like I said, if you're creating the range stylistically, I think for is cleaner. If the thing already exists, I think for each is cleaner, right? And uh, yes, there is this neat thing called zip with index, which will, you know, give you an index with a for each. Um, but it's something I find that kind of cumbersome. Um, okay, so like I said, once again, it's kind of more of a style thing. If people have any comments to share about this, I'll kind of give a quick pause. But the big picture here, of course, is if I have a for loop that executes, let's say, four times, and I have a connect statement in there, you should be thinking that of that as that's four connects operations being done. Now, if those endpoints are all different, then I've made four new connections, right? If, for example, maybe one of them, one of those endpoints is the same, uh, in particular, let's say the input is the same, uh, you know, I'm gonna keep overwriting myself and the last one's gonna exist, right? But the four and four each doesn't impact the Scala execution and what matters is, you know, the resulting chisel connection statements and such. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Um, so this is kind of a, a minor thing. In this course, we haven't really been grading projects too much on uh, efficiency. Uh, but sometimes uh, we've seen some things that can result in additional uh, and really unnecessary logic, right? Um, and although the CAD tools they keep hyping them up, oh yeah, CAD tools are amazing, let's make tools do the work. Uh, for a lot of these cases, yeah, the CAD tool can figure stuff out. Some of these cases, actually, they can't, right? So in other words, you kind of get stuck with the things I'm describing. Um, so what, what are some ones we've seen? Well. In a few of our projects, we actually work with 2D grid, especially like, you know, mat matrix multiplication. And so sometimes, you know, when iterating across that, that grid, we've seen students, uh, you know, use a single counter. And then to kind of pull out the row and column, do, you know, uh, you know, modulus and divide. And so although functionally that can actually deliver the correct behavior, um, there's some real drawbacks to that. Number one, um, you know, you have to kind of manually pull out row and column or we kind of actually have just those things already kind of there and be kind of explicitly visible separately, right? Um, additionally, the, the bigger issue is that actually modulus and divide are, are quite expensive in hardware, right? Think about the arithmetic operations, you know, uh, addition is the cheapest, <laughs> subtraction is a touch more expensive, just like literally one carry and a bit more expensive. Uh, and then multiplication costs quite a bit more uh, and then uh, divide costs more still, and modulus and divide uh, are the same uh, hardware typically. So yeah, a modulus and divide is actually, those are really quite expensive, so it's worth trying to avoid those if you can. So in the case of this, you know, counters, you know, for example, if you had two counters, one counter for row, one counter for column, and depending on the way you're iterating through those counters, maybe attach the wrap signal of one to the enable signal of the other, it might become a more graceful way to handle that. Um, Additionally, sometimes you may find yourself in a situation where you have maybe two counters and you want to turn that into a single dimension. In which case, maybe you have something along the lines of, you know, uh, you know, row times uh, num calls plus call to get, you know, a single index. Sometimes it's hard to avoid. But if you really think about your design, maybe you can figure out a way to avoid it. Because once again, you're kind of instantiating a multiplier that perhaps isn't necessary. For example, if you have a 2D collection for your things, if you have a vec of vecs of your registers, you can just use your row and column to index them directly rather than having to have that single dimension, for example. Um, additionally, in the most recent homework, we've made an explicit requirement 
Uh, when dealing with fields, like bit fields within a number, um, we have the ability in Chisel that's not available in C or Scala, right? We're able to say, hey, I want certain bits, right? There's a bit select. I can say I want high, comma, low, right? A certain range. We also can use tail and head to grab off uh, ranges of bits. What's nice about tail and head is if you use uh, tail and head with the same argument, uh, you actually get the two different parts of the um, uh, chisel variable, right? So you think about like a chisel signal, you know, like, like a uint or something, and you call tail and head on it, you know, you kind of might think, oh, I need to call like, you know, let's say it's n bits long, I want like these to be k minus n bits instead of one to be k bits, right? So you kind of use your head to kind of think I need to do math for you. The way these operators are defined, let's say you want k bits, you give k to one and uh, k to the other, and in one case you're going to get k bits, and in other case you're going to get uh, k minus n, sorry, n minus k bits. So it's going to do it for you automatically kind of nicely. And it's kind of following in the same spirit that uh, Scala does. That Scala also has a um, uh, compatible things like that that are kind of these two kind of uh, you know paired operations that work together the same argument, so to speak. Additionally, you're putting things back together. You don't need to do shifts or whatever. You can just use cat, right? And so cat and hardware, of course, is super cheap. It's just putting wires together. Um, selection is just grabbing wires. So these are basically you know no gates required, right? Uh, same with tail and head, right? So you, for these operations, especially you saw in the, in the crypto units, um, those are kind of really easy to kind of handle those kind of cases, right? You can just kind of grab the things you need to grab. Cool. Uh, questions on this stuff? Um, so uh, this one's a style one. This is not a correctness one. Uh, if you don't follow this advice, your code will work just fine. Uh, I find it when reading Chisel a little confusing when uh, very large things are instantiated inside a when statement. Um, so as a kind of reminder, right, as I said, our Chisel designs are really just instantiating Chisel things and connecting them together. Um, the when statements kind of control when those connections are taking place. It doesn't control the you know existence of a module, right? So if I instantiate something inside a when statement, that thing always exists. It's not like it's only there when the when's true, right? That's kind of like conceptually, I think for learning, it's good maybe not to do this too much if you can avoid it. Um, so yeah, so if I have like, seen this example down below, if I instantiate this counter inside a when statement, I get the counter no matter what. And the counter is always counting because I didn't you know use the counters enable field to um, control that, right? Uh, and so all this changing with that io.enable is really a connection to io.out, right? So when I say when io.enable, really the only impact of that when statement is not so much the val with the count, which maybe I can go ahead and get the mouse in the right place. Okay, I kind of know where it is. Oops, missed. And then back to the start, so maybe it's too risky. Um, but yes, uh, you can imagine moving that. Ooh. Our heroic TA just gave me a tip to uh, flash everything and get my mouse back, which is a huge help. So thank you. Um, and hopefully in the recording, it's not going to be too embarrassing. Okay, so um, this will work just fine, right? This gives the exact same behavior. The counter is here. Someone reading your module will know that you instantiate the following components, kind of give a sense of what you're doing. And then just the connectivity is changing, right? So these two are equivalent. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, I think stylistically it's more clear than what I just showed. Um, sorry, the having it outside is more clear. Um, there are some cases maybe it's better to have it inside. Like if it's literally just like a reg next you're doing or something, maybe it's okay to kind of bury inside. Maybe it's not just okay, but probably better, I would argue. But when it comes to trying to read someone's chill code and get a sense of what's going on, someone's kind of seeing the big components, especially like full on some models instantiating, those kind of declared up front and then um, uh, doing that kind of stuff. Additionally, of course, this is not something that chiseled intentionally, but because of the braces, right, uh, count is now scoped uh, to within these braces, right? So if I try to, for example, move this down, uh, you know, it's not going to work because I know it is. So um, perhaps maybe you can imagine a situation where limiting the scope is actually a feature, in which case maybe I should not get in your way. <laughs> Um, but uh, so let's like to kind of declare large things outside of one statement and connect them and then in one statement. So the when really just kind of controls when connections take place, right? Um, 
But the module is always instantiated. It's always going to exist. Okay. Um, this is a small one. Uh, if you remember when I covered the ranges early in the quarter in Scala, there's both until and to. Um, and you, you're right, it's not always easy to kind of remember this in the back of your mind, but what's nice about them is they're exclusive and inclusive, right? So uh, you shouldn't need to ever say like n minus one or n plus one when you're doing a range because you can just change from to to until or vice versa, right? So for example, you know, yes, here I have until, which is the exclusive bound. So it does not print the four, right? But if I change to two, it's gonna become inclusive and then it will print the four, right? So um, just a small style thing. Uh, you have both until and to available to you. Um, as a native English speaker, I, I will uh, agree. I don't think it's completely obvious from the outside why one of these semantically in English language is exclusive versus inclusive. I mean, I can, I can imagine until is exclusive, but why two is inclusive, uh, that's not obvious to me. But um, you, sh you should just learn the, the, the distinction between the two and remember it. And it's kind of annoying little detail to remember, but it's nice because we can avoid doing things like, you know, n minus one and plus one in our code. Um, yeah, and then of course the comment from Chad is, you know, uh, they also like the term until, it's kind of a clarity thing, but uh, a lot of papers use the word too. And like I said, I think to me, semantically, I don't know if until and two are like, maybe in a PL lecture they are, but as Arctic, I can't confirm this. Uh, maybe they always know what it means, exclusive versus inclusive, but just be aware that Scala has both. Kind of in a continuing theme, like I said, Scala is this rich language, it's, you know, a feature of everything, but if you can kind of learn all these features and master them, you can kind of have very nice, consistent, clean code that kind of very cleanly gets what you want to do. Cool. Um, great. And then this is kind of an interesting one that comes up. Uh, you may have seen in these various modules kind of tossing out, you know, require versus cert. Um, what's the difference? Uh, and actually there's a little bit of confusion about the two things going on here, right? So number one is require versus assert. We'll come down in a second. Even with just assert, there is actually, um, multiple flavors of assert. <laughs> and so, and they're all just called assert. Uh, so there's actually an assert already in the Scala language before we do anything. There is an assert uh, in Chisel, which Chisel kind of adds into the language and namespace. There's actually also an assert that comes up in Chisel tests, or sorry, Scala tests, which we're not even getting into that one. So everyone likes this word assert. Um, so what does it do? Uh, well, it depends, right? So if it's a Chisel assert, it checks the value in simulation. So when it's going to be assessed, remember, the Chisel thing, you know, during Scala constructing our program and you're know, constructing our design and elaborating it, our design is static. We don't even have values on our wires, right? The, vi the values kind of come in over simulation, right? So these assertions uh, are actually put into design and actually evaluated in simulation. They cannot go into real hardware. They're non-synthesizable Verilog, um, but they do work in simulation, right? So in simulation, if you want to you know, convince yourself something's working or not working, use an assert or let's just say, use a chisel assert. So how do you get chisel assert? Um, well, if the thing you're passing to that assert is a chisel bool, instead of a Scala boolean, a subtle difference, uh, it will get the chisel one, right? And it's gonna get turned into hardware. And I have an example of that in the next slide. Um, additionally, you can also add a little string in there if you wanna customize the assertion message, right? This is helpful uh, if you have multiple people using your codes, that way when the assertion gets triggered, people can realize, oh wait, what happened? Rather than just, you know, you get told some line number and someone's like, oh my gosh, what does that mean? So it's good to kind of help that. Um, meanwhile, the Scala assert, right? That's something the Scala is gonna use while your program is valid running. So that's gonna happen, you know, during your hardware construction phase, right? So this happens during construction, but non-stimulation, right? So if you get past construction into elaboration, those Scala asserts are invisible. They don't exist anymore. Um, and so, uh, how do you get the Scala assert? Well, if the comparison you're doing results in a Boolean, a Scala result, then that's how you get the Scala assert. So really how you get one versus the other, you know, this is the case of an overloaded function depends on what you're giving to as an argument. Um, cool. So I'm going to pause for any questions on assert first before we move on to this whole require business. Okay, so what's require? Require is also built into Scala. 
and Chisel did not overload it. So it's, it's still a Scala only thing actually. So what does require do? Require is also evaluating known Scala at runtime. Um, and uh, so they're both available inside Scala. And so you ask pure Scala programmers, why do we have you know require and assert? They have subtly different capabilities, right? Um, so require is intended to be used on input. So it's kind of like, you know, somebody's using your, your library function, your API, and you want to make sure a certain condition is on input. That's kind of why I use require. And actually I like that term a lot. It requires a good use of kind of, you know, aligning the language semantics of English with the actual purpose inside the programming language. It's a good one. Um, assert meanwhile is kind of, you know, saying, Hey, I want to make sure something is true about my code. Right? So require is kind of more for inputs or parameters versus assert is kind of more for your internal state. Um, but the other key difference is uh, using certain command line flags with a Scala compiler, you can actually have it remove all of the Scala assertions, right? Um, so the reason why you might want to do that is by doing that, you can you know speed up your Scala program, right? It's smaller because these assertions aren't there. It's also they're not going to be evaluated, so it's going to run faster. So for example, if you want to have like a debug versus not debug version, uh, you know one is easy way to kind of do that through assert. You can just kind of have them all globally removed or leave them in to have the checking, right? And so what's nice about that is sometimes, um, you know, developers, you know, want to have a lot of certs to check something, especially for debugging something, but they don't want to pay for it in production, right? And so having that ability to kind of remove all the certs all at once, that's why it's built into the language for Scala. Meanwhile, in Chisel, they didn't need to make this distinction, right? Because these assert statements aren't synthesizable. So they are in simulation, they slow down in simulation, but they don't have any cost in the actual hardware because they aren't in the actual hardware. So that's why it's kind of a nice stiff thing. Um, and so kind of finish up the Scala portion though, yes. So even though you can remove the asserts with that compile flag, sorry, you can remove the Scala asserts, you can remove the acquires, right? The acquires are still inside your code. So that kind of makes sense, right? You can imagine building a library, maybe you have the assertions for when you're debugging and testing it, uh, and maybe you want to have a really slim binary shipped in your jar file to you publish everyone else. You're gonna keep those requires in there because you wanna make sure people give the right inputs to your to your library. So that's kind of the, the thing there. So that's kind of you know the difference between assert and require. So what are we doing? You're probably gonna to wanna to use assert of the chisel variety and require most often. That's probably like we handle 99% of your cases. If you're writing a lot of Scala code, perhaps maybe like you know inside your Scala model to kind of get a behavioral model of your design, maybe at times you want to use the Scala assert to um, you know, check the state of your model and that kind of stuff. Uh, for the most part, since, you know, you probably aren't gonna need to worry about this ability to kind of compile away the stuff. Uh, that's the kind of extra details to being aware of why it's exists in the language, but that's kind of that. Okay, I'm gonna go on to this example. Maybe it'll kind of be more clear. So here we have a module, right? And there's a few things going on here. Number one, we want to make sure that the um, input width uh, is greater than zero. Right, so uh, that's that first one we're using to require, right? That's the Scala thing checked while string is constructed, making sure, hey, when a instance of check non-zero is created, width better be greater than zero. That's one. Now the next thing is looking at um, uh, a scale of Scala things, right? This is a Scala signal being compared against a Scala signal. So this is gonna result in a bool, a chisel, sorry, Chisel signal being compared to chisel uh, literal results in a chisel bool. So this is going to trigger the chisel version of a cert. Uh, here I'm demonstrating uh, the use of putting a custom error message there if you want. And this is our hardware, right? So if I look at uh, what comes out, you can see that, uh, oops, uh, can I scroll, zoom out more. Okay, so um, there's a lot of stuff here, but really, <laughs> That's the module, right? Our module connects the input to the output, and that's what you get. However, all this other stuff here, and you can see uh, it's not synthesizable, you know? So if not defined synthesis, in other words, if I'm doing synthesis run, uh, this is not gonna get triggered. Uh, it's gonna go ahead and you know, do the assertion checking and print out an error message, right? And you can see that, you know, hey, we actually got our um, message included, saw zero input. And by automatically chisel also, you know, inserted some additional stuff about where it was in our file. And because we're doing stuff in notebook, it's this weird, you know, unnamed uh, .sc file. But 
So that's an example of that, right? So I could have just as well have made this, you know, a Scala assert. It's going to work just fine. You know, and it's not going to get triggered unless I do something like that. In which case, oh, wait. Well, here I'm getting the, the match error, right? But we know what's causing this, right? That the reason what's going on is that there's an error uh, in Scala before we even get to the next part. Sometimes I find if I actually print out the fertile, the error messages in the notebooks are better. So here we see, for example, that we gave an illegal argument exception. That's what you get for require. With an assert, it's actually going to be a different exception, an assertion error. Um, but really, I think a legal argument kind of semantically better conveys what's going on here. Uh, and of course, yes, we can go ahead and fix this and make this uh, full size. And uh, here we have it uh, as the fertile. We're going to cover fertile uh, if we can next week. Um, but there's uh, the verilog. You can see there's a whole bunch of stuff here for this stuff. This is going to be handled just fine by the simulator. Um, but it's not going to get put into the actual hardware we generate. If you want to go into the actual hardware you generate, you actually just need to write the chisel logic yourself, and it's no longer kind of an assertion anymore. Um, cool. Uh, questions on this? Okay, so this last one's kind of an interesting trick, which might be helpful on the coming stuff. Um, so we've been so proud of ourselves for having, uh, you know, bundles and VEX to kind of have this nice, you know, rich way of describing things. Um, however, there's times where you don't want that. Uh, you, you'd rather have less structure and just kind of have a collection of bits. And what's interesting is in earlier versions of Chisel, uh, the need for this was very common. <laughs> you frequently said, you know what, I need to turn this into bits and then shoot, I was given a pile of bits, I need somehow infer meaning to these bits. Um, so this is something we've had to, I would have had to cover much earlier in the quarter and you'd be doing it much more frequently. Instead of a more modern chisel, they've done a fantastic job where the need for this is greatly reduced. The one place I argue you should do this sometimes is when it comes to memory. And this is more of a optimization rather than a correctness thing. So once again, analyze your design and until you know this is necessary for performance reasons or optimization reasons, don't actually do it. But here's the wrinkle. So if you make a mem, you can instantiate a mem of you know a type that's a vec or even a bundle. Totally valid. Under the hood, it's going to generate a different memory for every field. So the fields could be a field of the bundle, or it could be for every element of a vec. Right. So I'm going to do that right here with this example, uh, and you can see that you know it is generated. Um, you know, so I have a one bit and seven bit field in our bundle. So there is the one bit memory and there is the seven bit memory, <laughs> right? Or seven bit elements, right? So there's two memories. So in many cases, when it comes to synthesizing hardware design, this actually is a good thing. to kind of have things broken up that way. Uh, in some cases it's not, right? In this case, you know, maybe you wish they really were kind of kept together. So as an alternative, we're going to kind of flatten it and then unflatten it. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to just make a uint that happens to be big enough to hold it. So how do we know how to make it big enough to hold it? Well, we can use this get width feature on a bundle <laughs> to figure out how many bits the bundle will be. Uh, this won't always work, right? If your bundle has some un unspecified widths inside there, it's going to complain. But assuming those widths are known, it can figure this out. So I've now created a 8-bit uint memory. That part's not so bad. So now I'm going to get a single 8-bit memory. But then when it comes to re-inferring the great connections, remember we actually did type the uh, output with the right bundle, we can use this as type of feature and say, hey, we want to make it as type of this bundle. So we can go ahead and do that. And we've now done it. So we can't see the bottom because it's cut off because of the screen, but the important thing is now our memory is a single memory is eight bits per element. Um, and so yeah, it's kind of a nice little trick. Uh, like I said, it comes to actually instantiating memories in real design, you know, having a bunch of memories with very small fields may not actually be preferable in some cases. Maybe you actually do want to have uh, you know, fewer memories with larger elements that you pull the fields out of, especially if you have picture locality of your accesses, right? If you want to access all the fields all at once, you know, having them come from a single memory might be easier for people to implement down the line. Um, so kind of the nice enabling feature here is kind of two of them. There's as type of to kind of reinterpret something else, you know, assuming the bit match matchup, you can do this. Um, and yeah, so for example, I'm just curious now and have a little fun with this. What if instead of putting the right width in here, I put in like six. I'm pretty sure it's going to yell at me. Oh, it didn't yell at me, which is scary. 
Uh, okay, well then watch out. Uh, down below it's going to infer the bundle types, but incorrectly. So, yeah, this is not super robust. Uh, this is why it's great that for the most part we aren't flattening and unflattening our bundles, keeping things intact. It's kind of keeping that semantic information there. Um, but maybe this is that one case for optimizing memory where you want to actually do this. Cool. Uh, Oh, for sure. I mean, for me, the obvious answer would be, um, so the question is, wait, it seems gross. Why is there not a clean way to do this? Yeah, so, it, you know, I think the easier way would be um, to modify the mem constructor to have the option of where do you want to be split or not split, right? Um, and I imagine this is actually not impossible to do, right? So uh, we'll cover this more hopefully next week, but, you know, so fertile is kind of the processing uh, layer it takes chisel and turns it into Verilog or other languages. Um, and uh, as a super pro uh, Chisel user, you, you can often write your own fertile transforms to kind of um, augment that process, right? And so, yeah, I suspect it might be possible to uh, try to tweak that process. Usually it's easier to kind of add things in rather than change the default fertile behavior, but that still might be possible. Um, so yeah, I think in this very unusual special case, I think I think a cleaner option would be just to change the behavior of mem. And if you have this single behavior of mem changed as a kind of configurable parameter, uh, in my book, then there's no longer a need to um, flatten bits in and out like this anymore. Uh, sometimes maybe you might going in out of Verilog, but even with the black box support now, most times you don't. So yeah, this is my last remaining case of when I want to kind of flatten the bundle. Um, and this, this one arguably can be solved by perhaps changing the mem API. Great comment. Uh, other questions or comments? Cool, that's the last slide. So today was kind of a tour of a variety of things to kind of keep in mind as you're kind of working on your final assignments and projects. And so remember on um, Wednesday, your project proposals are due and we're gonna be uh, using uh, class time to meet with each group separately. So, um, uh, maybe it's best if you plan on coming to the lectures, but recognize that you're probably only going to talk for 20 minutes or half an hour in one of those two lectures, right? So let's say hypothetically, if you get selected to go on Wednesday, then you get um, it, done, it done on Wednesday and you want to come on Friday, but let's say hypothetically within the minute of us starting on Wednesday, um, uh, we'll be able to determine who goes when. Because we're, we're still in R and don't know which groups are out there. Um, so we'll have the proposal maybe do at 1 p.m. on Wednesday. We have time to kind of do it. Maybe slack out which groups are going when. Cool. All right. Well, with that, I'll uh, close uh, lecture. And if you have questions about your proposal, remember I have um, office hours tomorrow. We can talk more about that kind of stuff. Cool. Uh, I, I can stay a little bit longer. I'm going to stop the recording first. Uh, sorry, give me a second to do that.